Good morning. I am Pastor David here with the worship for Sunday, September 6th, Labor Day weekend. I hope you're having a weekend of joy and blessing. Um, this is a recorded um, worship service for the Sunday. We are gathering here on site on the church grounds for uh, outdoor worship service and chairs. Also, there's a spot for drive-in worship. So if you ever want to come to worship, you may do that by just driving in, taking your car, or bringing a chair and sitting in the lawn for the, for the worship service together. Um, we are worshiping here at Forest Hills Church where we love, grow, and serve. We love God, grow in Christ, and serve by the leading and enabling of the Holy Spirit. Our service today includes Holy Communion, and so I'm going to invite you to um, go and get some elements where you can um, celebrate Holy Communion with us. You'll need some kind of a bread substance, or cracker, or wafer of some sort, and juice of some sort, or even water is okay too. These are going to become, for us, spiritual food for our service. We're going to end with Holy Communion. So you, so you might want to pause this video and go get some bread and some juice so we can celebrate at the end of the service Holy Communion together. Our memory verse to today is talking about the end of life and what happens after we die. It's our theme for the, for the day. And our memory verse from Revelation 14, 13 glimpses into life after death. Join him with me. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Yes, says the Spirit. They rest from their labors and their deeds follow them. Revelation 14, 13. Welcome to Forest Hills Church online this Sunday morning. We want to encourage you and invite you to just worship with us wherever you're at. Uh, lift up your voice to our Lord and our Savior. Last week we mentioned, uh, we talked about how Jesus told his disciples to wait for the power of the Spirit, and that Spirit would give them the power to take the gospel message to the ends of the earth. And so we're going to sing a song called Cover the Earth. It talks about the, the power of the Holy Spirit working in this world. Salvation's pain 
Christ undefeated, we'll trample the grave. chapter 15 and Paul says listen I'm telling you a secret all of us won't die but we will all be changed in an instant in the blink of an eye at the final trumpet the trumpet will blast and the dead will be raised with bodies that won't de decay and we will be changed we hang on to this promise and this hope that Paul so uh, beautifully describes for us we turn to, we lift up our hearts, we lift up our voice as we turn to a song called Rejoice, the Lord is King. Your 
There's nothing else to do but to rejoice in all your works, to rejoice for the blessings that we've been given, and even to rejoice in the tough times, in the trials, in those times where we wish we were somewhere else. We rejoice because even in those times we know that you are there with us. And thank you, Lord. Give us your joy as we persevere, and give us more and more of your spirit, Lord, we ask. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, this is the last message in our Frequently Asked Question series, Your Questions Answered with Biblical Facts. I've not gotten to all the questions that I've been given, but some I have been addressing in the Monday morning devotionals. Our last question is, what is it like after you die? It's a fitting question for our Labor Day weekend because Christian tombstones are often inscribed, rest in peace, resting from labor. Those who die in Jesus rest from their labors. And our memory verse, Revelation 14, 13, says, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Yes, says the Spirit, for they rest from their labors and their deeds follow them. Maybe you can be thinking about that verse tomorrow during Labor Day celebration. I saved this question for last because I'll, I'll, I'll warn you, some, for some of you this may be a bit confusing and tedious. But if you hang in there, I'll try to flush it out best I can, scripturally. We know that those who die in Jesus, the gospel message is, don't die. We die, on, we die in earthly death, our bodies die, but who we are, our souls, don't die. They go to be with Jesus. John, uh, Jesus says in John 14 that we, not, we need not let our hearts be troubled, nor need we let them be afraid when we believe in Jesus. For he has gone to make a place, an eternal home for us. And someday, when the day is right, he will come back and take us to be with him. We can have peace and comfort, for we know that we go to a better place. We go to be with Jesus in glory. Now last week we also learned that on some, also on a someday, Jesus will come back and create heaven back here on earth. And that's where we will live for eternity with him, on earth. But what is life, life like for believers who die before Jesus comes back? What are they doing? Can they see us? Can they hear us? Do they know what we're doing, what we're thinking? Um, do they ever come back to visit earth? Hollywood has gone nuts with all kinds of ideas about souls living after death. They are, there are already Hollywood decora or Halloween decorations out in the stores ready to buy with ghosts and spirits and all kinds of walking dead. We have one of the world's most famous haunted houses, ghost stories, right here in Minnesota, up in Duluth at the Glen Sheen Mansion. There have been multiple sightings of ghosts of the heiress, Elizabeth Congdon, and her nurse, Velma Patila, who were murdered there in 1977. Do Christians believe in these ghosts? No, we don't. There is no biblical evidence for ghosts or even being um, having room for disembodied souls in anguish strolling the earth places where they were murdered. In my own mind, however, I can make a pretty good case for Satan wanting to play tricks so people believe in seeing ghosts in order to get people to believe that ghosts exist as a, as a ploy to discredit the biblical claim for the afterlife. So, what are the biblical facts? Well, let's start with the end goal. How is God's plan going to end? We'll, 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 we'll work back from there. The Bible only paints the bigger picture and doesn't offer all the juicy details that we are curious about. Someday Jesus will return, descending from the sky, leading the hosts of heaven, 
1 Thessalonians 4, 17, it says that those who have died in Christ will be raised from the dead in bodily form and will go to meet him in the sky. Then after the dead are raised, those who are still alive will be caught up to Christ in the air. And then this whole party will then descend to earth where Jesus will judge between the sheep and the goats. Matthew 25. Also Hebrews 9, 28. The sheep are those who love Jesus and they will be taken with Jesus into heaven. The goats are those who don't follow Jesus and they will be lumped in, in with, the, with the demons. There will be a great final battle between Jesus and the angels or between Jesus and the angels against Satan and the fallen angels. And in the end, Jesus will cast the fallen angels into the great fire, and finally Satan himself, before sealing up the fiery pit and casting it away forever. The old heaven and the old earth will be burned away, and God will bring down a heaven on earth, 2 Peter 3, 11-13. God will create, recreate earth, calling it the new Jerusalem, making heaven on earth, Revelation 20 and 21. The saints will live forever with resurrected and perfected physical bodies on a remade and perfected physical earth forever and ever. That's what the Bible teaches. So we get new bodies. That means we really don't have to care about our old bodies when we die, what we leave behind. We bury them, we can burn them, we can cremate them, we can throw them overboard into the sea. Revelation 20, 13 reports that when Christ comes back, the sea will give up the dead and those who are in it. And death and Hades will give up the dead that are in them. And each person is, will be judged according to what he has done. We will be raised physically. But for those who die in Christ, our new bodies will be perfect in every way. Paul says in Philippians 3.21 that Christ will come back and transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Now, after, after Jesus' resurrection, Jesus sat with his, with his disciples and ate with them. His body also had the scars left in from his crucifixion as a witness to his salvation. He won. But Jesus' body was also somehow different and distinct. Remember when he appeared to the disciples on the road to Emmaus on the Easter evening, afternoon? They didn't recognize him. He's a little bit different. Nor, 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 nor did Mary recognize him in the Garden of Eden. And he somehow passed through the walls uh, to appear to the eleven locked in the, uh, um, in the upper room that night. So our new and glorious body is described in Scripture in our passage um, from 1 Corinthians 15. Let's read, I'm going to read you parts from these verses, starting with verse 16. But someone, someone, some, ah, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? Fool, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And for what you sow, you do not sow the body that is to be, but a bare seed, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body he has chosen. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a physical body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a spiritual body, then there is also a, if there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. When this perishable body must put on imperishability, and this mortal body puts on immortality, and the saying that is written will be fulfilled, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Ah, that's heaven. And heaven is described in the grandest of terms because it cannot be accurately described using words or language. You'll have to experience it to understand it. It can't be explained. But for comparison's sake, the best things, the most valuable things we have here on earth are insignificant in heaven. Precious gold on earth becomes pavement in heaven. The new Jerusalem is far better than we can hope to imagine. Jesus describes heaven as a mansion in John 14. We will live with him. There's room for everybody, all in God's house. Heaven means that we have immediate access to God, living with God face to face with Jesus. 
Jesus also talks about heaven being a, like a grand feast where there's room for everyone, and he is the host. And heaven is life forever, John 3, 16, right? This is even declared way back in Psalm 23 at the end that proclaims that God's people will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's that mansion again. Also John eleven twenty five and 12, 24, 26. We have those wonderful passages in Isaiah that describe how swords will be beaten into plowshares and there'll be no more war, Isaiah 2, 4. How the wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat and the calf and the lion, and the little child will lead them, Isaiah eleven six. Revelation 21, 4 says that there will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. He will wipe away every tear. And there will be no more sin. Everything and everyone will be just the way God intended it. Side note. In Matthew twenty-two thirty, 30, Jesus says that after the resurrection, there will be no marriage. But instead, we'll all be like the angels who don't, 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 who don't get married. And I don't know what that means, per se, they'll be like the angels, but it would mean that, there, that perhaps we will be so close and intimate and in love with everyone that it will be like sharing that marriage relationship, not just with one person, but with everyone. Now, what about before all this? That's the intention God is going for. That will happen that someday. What about before then? What's it like for believers who die before Jesus comes back and sets up heaven in completion? What is life like for dead Christians now? Well, to begin with, we have to realize that this question is actually an earthly question. For you see, it assumes there's a time when my father died, for example, my father was alive, my father died, and now my father is not physically here on earth, and there will come a future time when Jesus comes back and my father will be raised again. There's a time continuum. But you see, the problem is, is that time is relative, particularly with God. God does not live in time. Time is part of the creation that God made. Before creation, there was no day or night or month or year. God lives outside of time. That's why the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that for God, the day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like, like a day. Second Peter 3.8. So, when we die and go to be with God, perhaps we leave the constraints of time behind Perhaps dead believers are not sitting around in a waiting room somewhere waiting for time to elapse to when Jesus will come back. Maybe after death, they go to be with Jesus, and to them, it is a twinkle of an eye on earthly time when Jesus comes back. So no one, so, so one idea that fits with the Bible is that the moment of Death for Christians on earth is the same moment of Jesus' return, since time is conflated. Can you get your head around that one? Huh. Well, let's try another biblical idea. Since I'm 50, I had the joy last month of a colonoscopy. Fun. I went in for the procedure, and they gave me something um, in my IV. I was alert. One moment, talking to the nurses, and the next moment I was waking up. The procedure was over. To me, only about five seconds had elapsed. But my watch said over a half an hour had gone by. We do this every night, don't we? We're not aware of time passing when we are asleep. And Jesus and all the rest are all over the Bible doesn't talk about the dead actually being dead. Jesus says, that Lazarus is asleep, as well as the little girl he raises from the dead. She's asleep. When Satan is stoned, the Bible reports he fell asleep. Acts 70, Acts 7, verse 60. So sleep is used all over the Bible to sh for death to show that those in God, when they die, aren't actually eternally dead. 
Jesus says in Luke 20, 38, that to God all people are alive, even those who have died. The God of Abraham is the God of the living, even though on earth Abraham was dead. This is where we get the phrase, rest in peace from. Isaiah 57, 2 says, those who walk uprightly enter into peace. They find rest as they lie in death. Also Job 3, 17. Same with our memory verse, Revelation 14, 13. So in death, our bodies stop living, but the actual person has simply shed her body. Her soul keeps on living. In the Bible, to be completely human, however, means you have to have a body. Human means body. So that's why in the end, God will give us bodies again, perfect bodies. Jesus has a body and keeps his physical body after his resurrection. He is fully human and always will be. After we die and before Christ returns, from an earthly perspective, we don't have bodies. We, have spiritual, we, have, we, live, we live spiritually only. But perhaps, biblically, we could think about it like our souls are sleeping. So biblical, biblical possibility number one, time collapse. The moment of our death is the moment of Christ's return. Biblical possibility number two, our souls fall asleep and wake up at the end times. Biblical possibility number three, our souls are awake with Jesus in glory until he returns. For to, to the thief dying on the cross, Jesus promised, today you will be with me in paradise. Right? Luke 30, 23, 43. Where that is, I don't know. We do know that it will be with Jesus, that it will be paradise. It will not be heaven in its completed form after Christ returns yet. But it will be paradise because it will be with Jesus. Paul says that Christians would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord in 2 Corinthians 5, 8. John had some visions of glory and wrote them down in what we call now the book of Revelation. Now, in Revelation, the new heaven and the new earth are described in chapters 21 and 22 with the coming of the new Jerusalem. But 14 chapters earlier, before that vision of the final coming of heaven, John gets a glimpse into glory, into the throne room of Jesus, presumably as it is now, in this in-between time. In chapter 7, John sees, now the problem is all symbolic imagery here. John sees the 144,000 of the sealed, the sealed souls, chapter 7, verse 4. And the great multitude from every nation and every tribe, all wearing white robes. That's Revelation 9, uh, 7, 9 through 14. This is after they had died, but before Christ returns, evidently. These are the elect and those who will be in heaven eventually. But before that, John describes these people on 7, 15, stand before the throne of God and serve him night and day, 16, they will never be hungry or thirsty. They will not suffer the heat or of the sun by day. Verse 17, the lamb on the throne will be their shepherd and will lead them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eye. And then in chapter 4, even earlier yet, which I think again is making use of poetic symbolism again, how much of this we read literally is not easy to understand. We don't know. But the symbolism here is that we see the elders casting their crowns down before Jesus over and over again. So another biblical possibility is that those who have died with Christ go to be in Jesus in his presence in his throne room in glory right now. They stay right by his throne until it's time for him to come back to earth. They have all their needs met. They do not suffer. They drink from the living water and have God's immediate comfort presence. And my apologies to our Roman Catholic friends, but I see nothing in Scripture to indicate even the slightest chance of purgatory. Now, a curious side note is that it seems to be possible for dead people to come back to earth. Way back in the Old Testament, in 1 Samuel 28, there's a strange story of when King Saul pays the medium of Endor 
to call upon the spirit of the, prof, of the dead prophet Samuel. And she does. Samuel, it says, comes up from the ground and demands of Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? In answer to Saul's query, Samuel then continues his prophetic role and foretells that Saul and his son Jonathan would die in battle the next day. And of course they did. So this is a real seance, and Samuel was called back to earth by satanic power. But here it's even again, this is allowed by God only because God wanted Samuel to deliver his prophetic message to Saul one more time. The other story of dead people appearing on earth, it comes in the New Testament when Jesus is transfigured. The story is in Luke 9, when Jesus temporarily basks in his divine glory. The, the disciples look up and they see two figures with him, Moses and Elisha, talking with him. Now, Eli, Elisha never did die in the Bible. He was taken away by the fiery chariot. But Moses certainly died. And in both of these stories, it doesn't seem that the people had bodies, but were present in spiritual form, or souls. Where they were residing, we don't know. Where had they been asleep, it doesn't say. But this is before Jesus' resurrection and ascension. But this suggests that they were in some kind of peace, because Samuel complains, why did Saul, did Saul disturb him? Now the Old Testament talks a lot about Sheol, seems to be the place where the dead people go, a vague gray place, souls go after death. Revelation 20 says that when Christ comes back, Hades will give up its dead. That's kind of the New Testament way of talking about Sheol. But wherever Hades is, that's using the Greek word there. And in Jesus' parable of the binding of the strong man, Jesus hints again symbolically that after he dies and before he is raised, he goes down to hell and unlocks the prison doors there for all the righteous to be able to not be bound in, he in, 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 in hell. But all of these references to Sheol, to Hades, and to hell are all symbolic and poetic. They're not literal descriptions. So how much of it we can take for literally, we, we don't know. There's also another symbolic reference in the first verse of Hebrews 12. In the previous chapter, the author lists many of the Old Testament figures of faith, the heroes. He says how they lived by faith, and by faith they saw the future glory of God, and the glory of God was bringing in. And then, beginning in chapter 12, he says, he says that all these saints who have gone on before actually surround the Christian who is now trying to live faithfully. It says in verse 12, 1, we are surrounded by a great, such a great cloud of witnesses who encourage us. So, what's life like after we die, but, we, but before Jesus comes back? The Bible really doesn't explain it. He seems to use three different ways of talking about it. Either time has collapsed, we are asleep, or people are with directly with God's, in Jesus' presence. And what it does say is it uses symbolic imagery. We must not be able to understand it yet, huh, on this side of, of death. I guess we have to wait to experience it to understand it. But what we do know, that the saints who have died in Christ are not dead. Their bodies have been given back to the earth, but their souls wait for new bodies. They've gone to be with Jesus, who's at God's right hand. They are at rest. They are at peace. They are in perfect happiness. They lack nothing, do not suffer. They drink from the living water and have God's immediate comfort. And there is, I think, a possibility from this Hebrews chapter that they are able to be with us in some way in this life. Somehow they gather around us as our great cloud of witnesses, encouraging us, rooting us on in our Christian lives faithfully. Well, we're going to celebrate Holy Communion here. And as we do, we proclaim that Christ died and rose again to give life to all who die in his name. We proclaim that the dead in Christ are not dead, but alive. John Calvin argued that the sacraments join 
us here on earth and those in heaven. This is a good way for us to imagine our loved ones. Who, uh, they are participating. Whenever there's faithful worship here on earth, like the sacraments, the saints of heaven draw near to earth, and draw and earth are gathered up into, into leaning towards heaven. So we all come together before Jesus, worshiping him as one body united, not separated by death. But we proclaim that his death and resurrection make us alive in this life and after earthly death. And as we celebrate communion t today, I want, you, I want you to be hearing these words from Hebrews 12, 1 to 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such, such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, so that you will not grow weary or lose heart. Amen. Let's celebrate Holy Communion together. So Hebrews says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. We do that through a time of confession before God. So I want you to be opening your hearts and your thoughts to the Holy Spirit's leading. Ask the Spirit to come in and do some evaluation. And take up to God what the Holy Spirit raises in your life needs to be surrendered, given up, confessed. Spend a couple of moments lifting that up to God and saying, God, I want to throw off the sin that so easily entangles and all that hinders me from following you wholeheartedly. Spend a moment in quiet searching your hearts before God. Holy Spirit, we listen for how you urge us to surrender what is bogging us down. Thank you that we don't have to hang on to this. We can get rid of it. We have forgiveness through Jesus Christ. We proclaim that by his death and resurrection, we are freed from our sin when we confess them. Lord, we lay them to you, before you, at the foot of your cross, where they are removed, atoned, and forgiven. Thank you, Jesus, for this newness the lightness, the blessing you give us. We proclaim that it is by your grace we are healed. Amen. We proclaim now that it is because of Jesus that we can push into the race and live wholeheartedly and fully. I invite you to go take your elements that you've collected, both the juice that you have, and the bread wafer or bread or some form of cracker that you have. I'm going to be asking you to grab those now, and we're going to be using them for our communion service together. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which was given for you. Do this whenever you eat it in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks, poured it out, and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you, do, as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, Almighty God, in remembrance of what Jesus has done for us, we gather before you and proclaim that this time is holy. We desire to run the race that you have for us. This spiritual food is the nourishment by which we spiritually run so that our souls may live spiritually forever. This body we leave behind at some point, 
but we feed now our souls. And we ask your Holy Spirit to make this bread and this juice sustenance for us spiritually. May the taking of it in faith infuse our souls with the energy we need to live faithfully and persevere. Holy Spirit, make this bread and this juice be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, faithfully running our races until Jesus comes back again and we get to feast at his heavenly banquet for eternity. We pray this now as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Take your bread, and if you have an ability to break it, um, remembering how Jesus broke his bread, break that bread, and then eat it, asking Jesus to be your strength. And take your juice, and I want you to remember that Jesus gives you this as a gift. And as you drink it, remember how he died on the cross for you to take away your sins and to give you resurrection of new life in glory that will last forever. We remember. Thank you, Jesus. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the gift of this sacrament and how you've united us with you to one another and your work in the world. Just like we look forward to someday, you will unite us all again around your heavenly banquet and we, we will feast at your, at your heavenly feast for eternity. We don't understand all that what it looks like, Lord, but the symbolic image is amazing. We claim on and hang on to that promise and claim it. Now, Jesus... Give us your Holy Spirit. That we may live faithfully, persevere, running the race you have for us today. In not our, only our strength, but yours bolstering ours. And in every day ahead, keep us giving us an eye looking forward to you, Jesus, coming back, an eye to the sky. We, we may be ready every day for you to return. Preserve us until that day. Usher us into your kingdom, we ask. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, as we think about and contemplate this heavenly home that God has in store for us, we're so grateful and thankful that he came to this earth to come and get us, to bring his enemies and turn them into his children. And so we're going to, that's our story. And so we're going to sing our story now as we conclude our service. Blessed assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story. Perfect submission, all the 
is at rest. I am my Savior and happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story. We leave now to go live out the races that we have in front of us. And one way you can do that is by giving financially to the work of our church and his ministry of supporting and enabling God's people to run the races that God has for us to run. So we please invite you to give your gifts electronically. There's ways to do that at the end of this video. You go on our church website. You can also just mail in your offerings or drop it by the church sometime. Or if you come to worship on Sunday mornings, there will be offering boxes available for you to do. Wednesday now, we are beginning our school program. School starts this week, and so we are lifting our schools in, in prayer. The Forest Lake District is going um, K through 6 in-house full-time, and then 7th through 12th is going every other day in-house. So we're going to need to cover our schools um, because of the COVID risk. We, we anticipate there to be increase in cases. We need God's help to work for our schools. And your schools, maybe in your area, may be doing a little bit different, but uh, we need to pray, be, be praying for our schools. But that also means that this Wednesday, we do start our um, summer, our, our fall um, school year programming. We're not going to be serving food on Wednesdays yet. It's still, we're in still the phase yellow of our plan, and so we're not serving food on site. But at 6.30, time change, 6.30, we will, we will be having Echo Junior, Echo, Confirmation, and Youth Group. So on site here in the building at 6.30, our kids programming is, is following that which our schools are doing as well, having kid program on site. We'll, we'll be masking up and doing social, social distancing, but prayers for you, from you please, are around our, our kids' education program. And also, invite your neighbors, invite your friends, have them come by. There's room for, for, for more. We have room to stretch out here, and we can be able to reach out into our community this way too. Our memory verse, um, again, let's try that together. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Yes, says the Spirit, for they rest from their labors and their deeds follow them. Revelation 14, 13. I want to end with this blessing from 2 Peter 3, 8. May the Holy Spirit fill you so that you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him belongs glory now and forever. Amen. Keep running.